Welcome to the Counselors of Real Estate's Top 10 in 10 podcast series. In these 10-minute episodes, we'll discuss one of the prevailing 2023-24 Top 10 issues affecting real estate. I'm your host, Jonathan Schein, CRE, and CEO and founder of the Real Estate Limited Partner Institute, better known as RELPI, in New York. Counselors of Real Estate are trusted advisors finding solutions to complex real estate challenges. Experienced, innovative, and credentialed problem solvers, counselors reside in 22 countries, practice in many more, and offer expertise in 60 real estate disciplines across all asset classes. Each has earned the prestigious CRE designation. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Hugh Kelly, CRE, principal of the consultancy Hugh Kelly Real Estate Economics in New York. Hugh served as global chair of the Counselors of Real Estate in 2014 and received the organization's highest honor, the Landauer White Award in 2019. Hugh was a founding faculty member of New York University's master's degree in real estate program, where he taught from 1988 through 2016, and more recently served as, Foreman, as at Fordham University's Real Estate Institute in several roles. He is also the author of the book, 24 Hour Cities, Real Investment Performance, not just perform promises. Hugh was the subject matter of the number seven issue on this year's compilation of the top counselor's top 10 issues affecting real estate, real estate Armageddon, economy, interest rates, and inflation. To review the, the issue, all the issues in this year's report, visit cre.org top 10. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you, Jonathan. It's great to be here with you. Hugh, in your discussion of this top 10 topic, last summer you said, and I quote, sales activity has dropped sharply and buyers and sellers both trying to come to terms with a reset on property values. Is the Fed choking the economy and tipping the market towards a real estate Armageddon? The outlook may not be as dire as it seems. As we get to the end of 2023, your relative optimism about Fed policy and the economy is sounding more and more on point. So why did many, so many economists and real estate prognosticators miss the story? So John, Jonathan, uh, there's no simple answer to that question uh, because the economy itself and the real estate business is so multi-layered. But at root, our economic thinking, which works well, very well most of the time, is grounded in a series of relatively easy to uh, understand linear relationships uh, that com are communicated in some straightforward equations. For instance, we think of the cycles of supply and demand recession and expansion, or of innovation and growth and, and maturation. Uh, there are two problems with this, with this approach. One is that seeing that the mathematical relationships are just approximations of the activities of the economy. Uh, <clears throat> and, but we insist sometimes that the world is an approximation of the math. And that's an Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass uh, perspective. And to add another point, we've had recurrent crises affecting real estate. Those crises didn't happen because we didn't do math well enough. Mm -hmm. They happened because while slicing and dicing the data, we neglected to make prudential judgments in investment policy and execution. And both of them are, are reasons that economists often get things wrong. Okay. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you're saying that econometric econometric models used by the Fed and financial institutions are as simple as as simplistic as these equations? I, I don't understand. Maybe you can help explain to the audience. Aren't these models basically populated by real data, complicated data? Don't don't we just throw history uh, out history if we ignore the actual math? Well, yes and no. Uh, anyone who's learned econometric model modeling understands that it's complicated and advanced math. You just have to look through the journal articles and, and, and the models themselves to understand that. But let me make two points. One, no matter how complicated, the mathematical relationships still have a connective tissue, whether direct cause and effect or probabilities or correlations. And those relationships are all basically linear, even if the lines are curved. And then secondly, in practice, even highly quantitative economists fall back on easily expressed economic relationships like the Phillips curve, the inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation, or the inverted yield curve, 
we've all heard uh, about that. My view on the Armageddon perspective is that the numbers, even when based in history, do shortchange the story of how uh, economic and real estate history actually transpired. A deterministic linear forecast is poorly equipped to shape executive decisions, either in the public or the private sector in a time of disruption. Even in Alan Greenspan, after the global financial crisis, had to admit with all of the army of PhDs at his disposal, he never at, at his disposal, he never saw it coming. So, so let me ask you something. You're, you're talking about a linear approach. So are these economic econometric models basically backward facing? Uh, <clears throat> well, they attempt to be forward looking, right? But they are based upon a series of uh, 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 of relationships, which in normal times are fairly replicable. The problem is that uh, we have periods in which we are not in normal times, in which we have disruptions. And the difference between a disruption and other forms of, uh, uh, of change, cycles, trends, changes of state, maturation of, of, of an industry, is that disruptions are nonlinear. They are breaks in the lines. And our models are very poor at anticipating them and then evaluating the consequences. That's that's a lot to digest to because so much of our industry is based on these models and things humming along quite quite smoothly. And so obviously what we need to do is start, you know, as counselors start assisting and helping some of our clientele on when those bumps could happen or those breaks in the line, as you've said. So let, no, let me no, ask you No, no question about it. And uh, about uh, seven years ago, I wrote a piece for, uh, for real estate issues on black swans and real estate, which is probably worth revisiting. Okay, we'll look it up. So your optimism will seem pretty suspect to those who have been looking at plummeting real estate transaction volumes and prices and who see a process of decline already underway, that, that the urban doom loop story that has dominated commentary over the past year. And isn't that based on some highly respectable academic research? There's a difference between the academic work itself uh, by uh, Steen van Neuenberg of Columbia and some colleagues at, at uh uh, NYU uh, Stern and, and at UNC Chapel Hill. There's a difference between that research and the way it has been reported out in the popular press. The academic work itself is generally pretty careful. It's modest in its claims, and it's very precise in its discussion. The media reporting and the blogosphere, however, have badly sensationalized this uh, story. So I don't want to dismiss the challenges that we face as cities and as real estate practitioners uh, 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 in the present time. But I do want to dispute the notion that the process of decline, which you see in this, this uh, graph taken from a, 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 a blog post, uh, is, uh, is inevitable, is inexorable, and the solution is to get out while the getting is good. Unfortunately, I've heard that mantra at least five times before over the course of my career. Sure. But fortunately, those challenges were met each and every time by innovation, by structural change, by leadership, and by vision. And the doom loop hypothesis leaves an inadequate room for economic agents, both public and private, to break the loop by concerted action. I believe this is actually the historical lesson that we need to pay attention to. And the models don't accommodate that. That's well. That's one of the issues of human nature. We never quite learn our lessons, do we? Uh, you know, uh, it goes back as far as as the Bible, doesn't it? It certainly uh, does. You know, uh, uh, Book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the Book of Kohelet. You know, uh, what has been done has been done before, and there is nothing new under the sun. Well said and well put, but uh, not true. <laughs> but not not true. I'm I'm going to absolutely not true. I'm going to go back to to my Saint Augustine, 
uh, who said in the city of God, Initium et eset homo creatus est, in order that there might be something new, human beings were created. And, you know, that's, that's an important correction. I mean, and we're also getting a, la a lesson in Latin today, Hugh. Thank you. So, yeah, but, I can't, uh, deny, can't deny my roots. <laughs> but isn't there a question of degree to be considered? After all, the suggested decline in values for offices is said to be on the order of 40% of more. Isn't that catastrophic outside the bounds of normal, of a normal cycle? Well, for sure. We don't have a normal cycle. Uh, I totally agree with that. It's why I've been insisting that our usual way of economic thinking, which is largely linear in character, has to be adjusted to reflect the nonlinear change that happens during disruption. Uh, I've developed this graph. This is in uh, a, a textbook that I have forthcoming that I've co-authored with uh, Tino Karologos, CRE, and with Mary Frankel, both of, over at NYU. Uh, and it shows how forms of change interacts. So we're used to cycles and trends and maturation and change of state, the linear forms, but they interact with each other and they interact with disruption. The typical linear changes, uh, 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 you know, become unpredictable under uh, disruption. They become chaotic. They mutate. Sometimes they metastasize, metastasize over the whole economy. So it's not un so unusual to think about these kinds of, of interactions, although we rarely do it. We really we usually focus on where are we in the cycle? What's the main trend, right? You know, and uh, anytime you get a new medication from your doctor, you worry about the interaction that that has with other medications that you might, might be taking. And uh, your pharmacist will sometimes say, I can't fill this prescription because you're also on X, Y, and Z. And we need to think economically about those kinds of interactions as, uh, as well. And they include chaos, vector breaks, mutation, and, and metastasis. The critical question to me is not whether we're facing a catastrophe outside the normal cyclical parameters, which was your question, right? Yes. But it's whether our current challenge is more severe than the historical conditions that we've confronted successfully over the course of our working lives, which for me is 50 years, right? Well, well why are we facing something completely different and more difficult? Technology has increasingly changed been challenging to brick and mortar real estate. Retail has, always, has already felt its comeuppance. Doesn't it look like uh, offices turn? And, and doesn't that call into the whole question of urban renaissance story that we've been hearing about for the last quarter of a century? Uh, should, shouldn't investors know when to hold them and when to fold them? Yeah. And of course, you know, I feel this acutely, you know, there's a, 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 a book signing uh, uh, poster on my wall from the 24-hour city book. Uh, so we need to break that viewpoint, I think, into, into a couple of components. On the one hand, I'm not at all certain that the current crisis is more severe than the past assaults on, on the system. In the last third of a century, we've confronted the collapse of the thrift industry. We've had to deal with the challenge to urban real estate that was epitomized by the 9-11 events. When you'll remember, Jonathan, People are saying businesses are going to flee the cities. No one is ever going to rent the upper floor of a skyscraper ever again. Never. You know, uh, and then, of, of course, with real estate, the catalyst for the global financial crisis, who is going to put their money into real estate again? You know, and uh, for each of them, uh, folks were ready to give up on big cities. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Dire expectations were met with resilience. And, you know, go back before the beginning of this graph, uh, you know, the civil unrest uh, that afflicted the cities in the late 60s and early 70s uh, led many people to think that 
a number of cities, including New York, including Washington, D.C., including Washington, including San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, you can go down the list, would never recover from the riots. Right? Well, yeah, how did that happen? How did that happen? You know, um, it happened because people got together. Right? Almost a Doris Kearns Goodwin team of rivals kind of a kind of a story. Um, you know, so rather than say that the COVID era and and its aftermath, including work from home and, and the slow return to office, proving that the 24 hour city uh, hypothesis has been disproven. I'd say that other cities that were not on that short list of 24 hour cities, including small cities like Nashville and Austin, and even areas of other cities like Midtown Atlanta, the Bunker Hill area in Los Angeles, uh, the Lodo area in, uh, in, in Denver, have adopted and adapted to their local circumstances the principles of mixed use uh, urban, urban centers. So rather than uh, it uh, being eclipsed, I see it being propagated around, uh, around cities in the country. Now, the history of technological uh, innovation has often led to a, a, a discussion of how the death of distance is gonna disadvantage big cities. But in fact, big cities have been the early adopters of most of those technologies. And I think we'll see that again in the current technological advance that we're seeing in uh, artificial intelligence. Why? Because big cities have two things going for them. One is economies of scale. In introducing a new technology, you're introducing it into the biggest market that's available when you're introducing it into large cities. That's important. And then secondly, uh, big cities are where the talent gravitates towards. Uh, why? Again, because these uh, offer the infrastructure, uh, both intellectual and physical, that support uh, the innovation and the interactions between the innovators which stimulate uh, 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 new, new growth and give uh, 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 these, these cities the advantage of, uh, of being early in the curve. And then other cities play catch up against that. Uh, and so I think that's a repetitive thing. No single agent uh, was successful in overcoming the crises of the past. Uh, it takes leadership, but it takes a willingness to collaborate recognizing that self-interest is a broader concept than hooray for me and the hell with everybody else. You know, uh, who would benefit? That's always a, a key question, both in law and in, and, and in economics. Who would benefit from a reinvention of office real estate, a return to office that would be not a return to the status quo, but a creative reestablishment of urban mixed use districts. I see motivations from local governments seeking to safeguard their revenue base uh, and to improve their quality of life. I see really investors having self-interest in having uh, 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 this reinvention of the, of the office district come into to place so they have common cause with the government. So do the holders of real estate debt you know, who need to have their collateral protected. Corporate tenants are actively seeking to bring their uh, uh, their workers uh, back, if not five days a week, three days a week. Uh, developers have reason to embrace this, obviously. Office workers, the service workers that work in, in the buildings uh, do as well as do the workers in transportation systems the retail workers in the downtowns, the tourism, all of these are aligned. What's required is some uh, 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 some leadership to pull those things together. Um, you know, again, the, the idea is that self-interest is not hooray for me, the hell with everybody else. It's how do we work together on solving a common problem? You know, I go back to uh, the... <clears throat> 
fiscal crisis of New York City in 19, uh, uh, in the 1970s. We had a by the numbers mayor, Abraham Beam, who was just not up to the job. What did it take? It took pulling together investment bankers uh, like Felix Rowerton from, uh, uh, from Lazard Frere. It took the governor of New York. It took uh, the real estate industry itself, led by Lou Rudin, who established the uh, Association for, for a Bet at New York. It took the unions who were willing to put their pension funds on the line to invest in New York City bonds and then in Big Mac bonds. It took all of it together, and then it took the leadership of, of Ed Koch to to uh, to cheerlead it. You know, so I I see that uh, uh, the the situation we're in now, you know, compared to New York's fiscal crisis where we lost eight hundred thousand residents and six hundred thousand jobs within a ten year period, this is a blip on the radar screen, and that's yeah. the way I view it. And and. The federal government was not coming in to step in and help. I mean, this a lot but of people, but eventually they did. Okay, that 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 and that's forgotten. Uh, yes, the famous headline was Ford to City Drop Dead, correct. But four months later, New York City's bipartisan congressional delegation, which had Republican senators and Congress people as well as well as as Democrats pushed forward to uh, uh, to reconsider. Same was true in uh, in the 9-11 circumstances. The federal government played a huge role in the RTC issue, right? But they, didn't do, they didn't do it alone, right? The real estate industry needed to reinvent itself, to have the second generations of RE, REITs, to come up with the adaptation of uh, Fannie and Freddie to commercial real estate in the CMBS market. So that's our challenge. You yeah. know, we, could, we can give up. We could say it's an urban doom loop and we can't get out of it. Or people say, hey, it's in my interest for this not to happen. Who are my allies? And that's what I, that's what I see as the story of 2024. Well, you know, Hugh, thank you. First of all, you're the most optimistic economist I've, I've ever encountered. Um, we're grateful for your knowledge and contributions to this year's top 10 issues affecting real estate report. While it may be subject to debate as to whether we are in a post-COVID or late-COVID era, the disruption of the pandemic certainly has, offered long, has altered longstanding patterns of property utilization across virtually all property types. Thank you, and join us next time for an another discussion of one of the top 10 issues affecting real estate. I'm Jonathan Schein on behalf of the Councils of Real Estate. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Top 10 in 10.